Where is Jennifer Dulos? There are so many unanswered questions in this case. As I was trying to organize my list of questions for this video, I realized there are too many. And as I went through, I had more and more questions. So you're not going to get all of the questions here, but it's a start. Let's talk about questions generally for a second, then specifically. They say that curiosity killed the cat. I say curiosity catches criminals. An investigator can ask a question about what seems like a small thing and find the answer leads nowhere. But that's okay, because then the question has been dealt with. Sometimes, though, the answer to that little question opens a whole new pathway or is revealed to be that one thread that you pull on that just keeps unraveling everything. In the Jennifer Dulos case, clearly there are paths not yet discovered. Let's ask some questions. If you have questions I don't ask, or if any of this raises new questions or thoughts in your mind, or if you have a niggling thought or curiosity, please drop it in the comments. Even if no one has an answer, your question might twig somebody else's brain. You never know. If you provide information in the comments, please indicate what the source of that information is so that people aren't operating on rumor or speculation. If you have information that is not already publicly available, or if you have anything or knowledge that might be evidence, please do not send it to me. Send it to law enforcement. If you're worried about that, then speak to a lawyer. But I should not be receiving evidence of any kind, nor should anyone else who isn't involved in investigating the case. Let's start with early 2017 and the gun. ABC News reported that court documents showed Fotis threatened to kidnap the children and take them to Greece. Also, Jennifer said she was afraid that Fotis was going to do something terrible to her. I'm just going to interject here. Victims know. They might not be able to explain it well or articulate everything, but they know. When someone tells you that they're afraid of somebody, always take it seriously. Court documents show that Fotis bought a gun in early 2017. What happened to that gun? Did he still have it in 2019? If not, then where did it go and when and why? Did the police ask about it? We've heard nothing about it. Stalking and surveillance. Prior to Jennifer's disappearance, Fotis showed photos of her house to Pavel and the tech guy at Four Group, asking if they thought various things were cameras. Now, this is according to Pavel. Didn't those guys think that was weird? Did no one ask, hey, why are you taking pictures of your ex-wife's house and why do you care if there are cameras? When Jennifer disappeared, did either Pavel or or this tech guy immediately call police and tell them about this? Well, we know Pavel did not. What about the other guy? Did the police ever interview him? Why wasn't he called to testify in court? If the police never interviewed him, why not? And what else does he know? Did Fotis ever ask him other questions about cameras? Did police recover those photos of Jennifer's house from Fotis' phone? When exactly were those photos taken? Were they on a day when Fotis had visitation with the kids anyway? He wasn't even supposed to be in the driveway until the supervisor got there. So how is he taking pictures without being seen? If these photos were taken on a day or days when Fotis didn't have visitation, then did police attempt to retrieve video from the area to track him on whatever days he took the photos? If not, then why not? Stalking is a huge pre-incident indicator, and it goes to premeditation. And according to Michelle, Fotis had been talking to Kent a lot in the months leading up to Jennifer's disappearance. Were these photos of Jennifer's house even taken by Fotis? By the camera in Fotis's phone? 
Could they have been taken by someone else and then sent to Fotis? The phone data would show that, but we're only hearing from Pavel. So why didn't we hear from the police about those photos? Were there other times when Fotis was lurking around Jennifer's home or places she was known to frequent? Did he recruit anyone else to drive by and provide him information? These are common things that abusers do. In the months preceding Jennifer's disappearance, was Fotis or anyone close to him ever seen around the train station or Talmadge Hill Road or Old Stamford Road or Weed Street? Fotis showed up for visitation an hour early on May 22nd. When the supervisor arrived, Fotis wasn't there. I don't doubt the nanny's testimony on this, though. The question is, where did he go? If he was doing a final scope of the area in preparation for the crime, where else did he go? Did police pull video in the area to track him for the 22nd? It seems awfully risky for Fotis to drive an hour and a half back to Farmington with a body either in the bed of the truck or in the front seat. It makes more sense to either dispose of her body nearby or to have someone else transport her to another location away from both New Canaan and Farmington. Where was Fotis's phone on May 22nd? Did he have it with him and simply not answer it? Or had he left it at home or in the office? Michelle had texted him that night and she was mad because he hadn't answered her call. So she sent him a text of a middle finger. Could he have left it behind so he couldn't be tracked doing his last minute scoping of locations? I don't know. I'm just asking questions. I have a number of questions about the morning of the 24th at Fort Jefferson. Things that don't make sense and some gaps in the evidence but I need to let that percolate for a while. I should let you know about a belief I have and an assumption I've made because if I'm wrong about my premise, it changes everything. The belief. I'm convinced that Fotis went to New Canaan and took Jennifer, whether he was the one who did the final deed or not is another thing, but her death is his doing. And my assumption is that Fotis rode that bicycle from Fort Jefferson Crossing to 80 Mountain Springs that morning, loaded it into the Tacoma, and drove down to New Canaan. Although the neighbors beside Fort Jefferson Crossing had cameras and can see the back of the property, Fotis was not seen taking the bicycle out or riding it, and no one can say who was at the four group office or what vehicles were parked back there that morning. Everybody's assuming that nobody was in there, but that's not a safe assumption to make. And Fotis was never seen riding the bike anywhere along the route. It's not just that he wasn't seen riding into the driveway. And there's a conflicting story about where Pavel's dirt bike was. I just thought I should point these things out in case I'm wrong about how and when the bicycle got to the Tacoma. The plates. I think most people figured that those altered plates were used on the Tacoma, and that's a reasonable conclusion. But there are questions about how and when vehicles were moved around on Lapham Road, and there's a period of time when the Tacoma disappears from Lapham. So I'm wondering if there was a second vehicle and the plates could have been used on that vehicle. I don't know. I'm asking questions. Question. Why would Fotis alter his old plates and then switch out the Tacoma plates before and after the crime? Why not just alter the plates that were already on the Tacoma? And some people have suggested that Fotis tried to frame Pavel. Well, if that was true, why would he alter the plates at all? And why would he insist that Pavel dispose of the seats. And why would Fotis take the truck to be cleaned instead of simply clean out any obvious stuff and leave any evidence that might frame Pavel? Sorry, I'm off topic. Back to the plates. John Schoenhorn remarked that there were screws missing from the Tacoma plates. 
No one ever talked about this again. Pavel said he'd taken the plates off of the Raptor. He said it was to fix the bumper. It might be a red herring, but questions. Let's look at the Raptor. The front plate looks askew. Does anyone listening know a lot about vehicle repair? Are you seeing damage on this bumper that would indicate the bumper had been knocked off? What, if anything, does this photo tell you? Look at the rear of the Raptor. Does this tell you anything? Would someone need to remove this plate to put on a bumper that had been knocked off? Also, look how dirty this vehicle is. Why didn't Fotis take this one to the car wash? We know he transported evidence in it. You would think he'd want to hurry up and get that cleaned. But no, instead, he cleaned the Tacoma. And I'm noticing here on the driver's side door, a void in the shape of a rectangle where there's no dirt. The set of keys, the set that was found in the garbage. It appears that no one attempted to find out what these keys belong to. Why not? If the keys did not fit into any of the known vehicles or homes, would that not raise a new set of questions? It's weird that no one tried to see if they matched Jennifer's house or any vehicle. The backpack. Nobody's talked about this. Again, my premise is that it was photos seen on the bicycle on Weed Street. Now, really, when you look at the video, you can't tell who it is. I think it was Fotis. He was wearing a backpack. Well, that would be his crime kit. We saw no backpack in the garbage, but there was a lot I expected to see in the garbage that was not present. More on that later. Did police find that backpack? Did they look for it? They never asked Michelle about it. Did they ask anyone else about it? Where is it? Back to the bicycle. Michelle said she saw it in the garage at Mountain Spring. And we know that Pavel saw it because he'd made a joke about it. Where did the bicycle go after that and when? When did it leave Mountain Spring? Who took it? Kimball knew about the bike being left at Mountain Spring because Michelle told him. Did he not request surveillance footage for other days to find out when the bicycle was removed from Mountain Spring? If not, then why not? The bucket from Jennifer's garage. The nanny testified that there were cleaning supplies missing, not just all those rolls of paper towels. Well, there was a bucket missing from the garage. It was never recovered. It was never seen on video anywhere. Like we saw the pillows when the guy was going through the garbage. Where did it go? People keep asking me about the two ponchos. One was a actual poncho with a hood. And the other one was a clear plastic bag with holes cut in it in a fashion where it could be used as a poncho. Because of the evidence, I think that the poncho with the hood was put onto Jennifer. And the reason I say that is because all over the inside of the poncho was Jennifer's DNA. So that's on the inside, not the outside. So my theory, I guess, or my speculation is that the poncho was put on Jennifer to prevent her DNA and hairs and fibers from ending up in whatever vehicle she had been placed in. And that brings me to the zip ties. If the plan was to kill her in the garage and then transport her, or if she was in fact deceased by the time she left the garage, why do you need zip ties? That little detail and a few other things make me think Maybe she was still alive, seriously injured, perhaps unconscious, but still alive at the time she was taken from the garage. And then that begs the question, why? I think there was a second vehicle. They put the poncho on her to protect whatever vehicle that they were using, or vehicles plural. Let's talk about magically disappearing and reappearing vehicles, specifically the Tacoma and Jennifer's Suburban. The Tacoma was caught on the school bus video in the morning. Now, at this time, Fotis is driving his bike, but then later, the Tacoma is not seen, and neither is the Suburban. The police asked Michelle if Fotis had a chainsaw, 
And she didn't think so. So they talked about that sort of thing. She mentioned he had an axe. We never heard about any of Fotis's tools being examined or Pavel's for that matter. The plant material. They found a bag in the garbage full of plant material. They sent that material to an agricultural lab. And then we never heard anything about it. We saw and heard a lot of things that turned out not to be relevant at all or turned out to be nothing. And the argument or the reasoning is, well, we have to show the completeness of the police investigation. But there's a whole lot missing. There's a whole lot that they started to do or questions that were asked that were never followed up on. We never heard about that plant material, even though it was sent to the lab for testing. So if it was nothing, we should have heard about that. Just like in one of the photos of the trash that was collected, there was a shirt, a white t-shirt full of staining that looked like it could have been blood. And then it turned out not to be relevant to the case at all. And it wasn't until the defense in the Michelle Traconis trial said, I need the prosecution to admit to this and state this that that even came out. And as far as plant material goes, somebody in the comments made a really good point, and that was in respect to the vehicles and plant material. And I'm thinking specifically about Jennifer Suburban. We know that there is an agricultural lab. Not every place has access to that. They could have taken samples of plant material and soil from the tire treads of her suburban, from the undercarriage, the wheel wells, that sort of thing. So if that vehicle had been taken to a place where a particular kind of plant or a particular composition of soil existed that didn't commonly exist in other areas, they could narrow down where that suburban went. Let's talk about Deer Cliff. I have questions about that place. There was a camera there, and and the testimony was that there was no power source to the camera, and there was no memory card in it. The questions are, was there no power source because there never was one? It was just put up there? Was there previously a power source that had been disconnected because maybe somebody didn't want something caught on camera? Do people put up real cameras, which are expensive, as dummy cameras? I mean, I suppose it could have been an old broken one, but I'm curious. Does the insurance company on that property indicate a camera should be there or that is there? And while we're talking about Deercliff, Pavel was back and forth then back and forth and his story didn't match up with the video and his story doesn't make sense. It's convoluted. He said he went to Deercliff. He picked up a board so he could load up his dirt bike. Then he's driving around. We see on video, he's driving around with this board in the Raptor. Why are you driving around with the board? Why didn't you just either put it in the Tacoma or take the Tacoma there later? It just, it doesn't make any sense. He testified. He loaded his dirt bike into the truck at Deercliff. So then why did he have to go to Deercliff to get the board? If he was going to load it already at Deercliff, why does he need to pick up a board and drive it around? If both the dirt bike and the board are at Deercliff, why does he have to go get the board? This doesn't make any sense. He also said he rode the dirt bike from Fort Jefferson. Well, why? Why not load it up at Fort Jefferson? And where's this surveillance video of Pavel driving the dirt bike. And just another thing about the dirt bike, he had to return that dirt bike to Michelle. He had paid Fotis money for it. He didn't get a receipt and he never got the the title for it. And he ended up having to give it back. I bet you he was mad. He liked that bike. Interestingly, the testimony that he gave about how Michelle said derogatory things about Jennifer, well, Those comments came after he had to give back that dirt bike. None of that ever came up earlier. And that Tacoma. Pavel had that Tacoma all weekend long. And you know, he's testifying that 
Fotis insisted that he change out the seats and that Fotis said, call the seats hardware. We didn't see any texts from Fotis to Pavel. We saw no phone information from Pavel at all. And there was a period of time when Pavel had both the Jeep and the Tacoma at his house at the same time. How did that happen? How did he get both vehicles there? And where was Pavel on the day of Jennifer's disappearance? Between 12.30 p.m. and 4.21 p.m., that truck is not at the job site and there's no info on where it was. And we know he wasn't at the job site because of surveillance from across the street in addition to the data. So where was he? The cell phone pairing. Jennifer's cell phone paired with her Suburban at, I believe it was 2.56. It was the middle of the afternoon. Well, by that time, Fotis was back. So it couldn't have been him. There are a number of things in this case that make me believe that there was somebody else involved in New Canaan, either at the time of the murder or later on that day. The school bus caught the Tacoma on Lapham Road at 7.40 a.m. and again at 7.57 a.m. But when the bus goes by at the end of the day, the Tacoma's not there and we, we know it's not there because it's now seen back in Farmington. But Jennifer's Suburban wasn't there either. But at some point in the afternoon, Jennifer's phone paired with the Suburban. Maybe Fotis' accomplice purposely paired the phone with the Suburban in the middle of the afternoon because he knew that Fotis was back up at Mountain Spring and had an alibi. So that accomplice would make it look like maybe Jennifer was going to the park and had been abducted. Just a thought. That would make the cell phone pairing make sense. But then that would raise a whole lot of other questions like who was the other accomplice? The other thing that wasn't talked about a lot in the Traconis trial, but that came up was that dogs tracked her scent to somewhere near the train tracks or train station. I don't think anyone thinks that was Jennifer, but somebody covered in Jennifer's scent would lead those dogs to that location. So could there have been a second vehicle parked somewhere up there? Or could Jennifer's vehicle have been parked somewhere up there? Let's talk about the DNA. Jennifer's shirt and bra were found inside a sealed bag. On that shirt, there was unknown male DNA. Fotis and Pavel were eliminated as possible contributors to that DNA. Who was it? There's so much that points to another person being involved here. And there was unknown DNA on a lot of items, and specifically unknown male DNA on a number of items. So one of the questions that would have to be asked first is if this unknown DNA on, let's say, item A, B, and C are a match to each other. So are we looking at one unknown male DNA in the sealed bag? Is that DNA the same as found on the other items? It doesn't tell you who it is, but it would tell you whether or not it's the same person's DNA on all of those items. In any event, the male DNA on the bloody shirt in the sealed bag is significant. You can't say it came from the city trash. So whose is it? And why was Kent Mawinney's DNA never compared with that? Did his lawyer somehow manage to prevent that from happening? And if so, I mean, the police can go in your garbage. And speaking of Kent Mawinney, I found a news report from when he was first arrested. And Kent's neighbor said that she noticed a cleaning company at his house for, I think it was a few days after Jennifer's disappearance. And the neighbor thought it was really odd. 
even at the time, even without knowing that there was any connection between Mawinnie and Fotis Dulos. Are we going to hear about that? I don't want to say scary, but a little concerning considering the charges brought against him. Alex Apola says once she learned of the arrest, she remembered seeing a cleaning company at Mawinnie's home the past few days and thought it was odd. Let's talk about the contents of the garbage. In one of the bags, they find her shirt and bra. The clothing has clearly been cut off. Why would you cut off the clothing? Well, one is if you bury somebody, the clothing and especially metal or plastic buttons and clasps and that sort of thing won't degrade quickly. If a grave is discovered, then the clothing can give clues to the identity of the person. Another possibility is dismemberment and the clothing would be in the way. And there's another possibility, and that is that she was still alive when that happened, that perhaps there was an additional element to this crime prior to her life ending, and that would not be uncommon. And again, that would explain the need for zip ties. And they found the shirt in bra in one bag, but no underwear or pants or shoes in that bag. And that, along with several other missing items, makes me think that the disposal of not just the cleanup evidence, but of her, was perhaps divided up between two people. You take these items, and you take these items, and you go to two different geographical areas to dispose of them. And chillingly, there was a panty liner found in one of the garbage bags, but no underwear and no pants. Now think about that. Why would you remove the panty liner and throw that away? Why would that be separate from the pants and the undergarments? I will refrain from giving a theory here and just let you think about that. I have more questions, a lot more, that I haven't asked. And if this was my family member, I would not want people to stop looking. Yes, I know, Fotis is dead. Kent Mawinney is going to have a trial. Michelle Tricone has had her trial. But there are still too many unanswered questions. There's too much outstanding. And as far as I know, there's not an ongoing official search for her. Not an active one anyway. But if somebody's memory is jogged or somebody realizes, hey, you know, I saw this thing and I didn't think much of it at the time, but now I'm thinking it might be important. And somebody comes forward with something, with a new lead, fresh information. Maybe the search for Jennifer could be kickstarted. There's just too much missing. So if you know anything... Pass the information along to the police. I don't think that Jennifer was taken up to Farmington at all. I think it would be too risky. I think it would be too difficult. I think either she's somewhere around New Canaan or somebody else transported her to another location entirely. Trust your gut. I'll see you in the comments.